Great. Hello. Hello. Welcome to Solutions by Michelle, Lauren, Leilani, and Catherine. So first we're going to start off with giving the three definitions of a solvent, solute, and solution. So a solvent is the substance in which the solute is being dissolved. Most of the time well, it'll be water or some other liquid. Um, a solute is the substance that is being dissolved. In this example, it's green powder. And then finally, a solution, it's basically the end result. So a solution is a homogeneous mixture made up of two or more dissolved substances. And most of the time, your solution will be a liquid, but it can be gas. So next we're going to talk about suspensions. Suspensions are heterogeneous mixtures that contain solid particles that are too big to dissolve so they kind of just settle at the bottom of the glass. The important thing to note about suspensions is that they are not solutions, they're very different because um, the solvent and solutes cannot be solved. Um, a great example of suspension is if you were to put flour in water and mix it, they don't really mix together so the heavy flour particles kind of just fall at the bottom of the glass. So colloids. Colloids are really cool because they kind of serve as the middle ground between solutions and suspensions. So they're homogeneous mixtures where the particles are not as small as ones in a solution but not as large as ones in a suspension. And this is because particles range between 1 and 1,000 nanometers in diameter. A great example of this is actually if you were to put mud in water because the large particles of mud would sink to the bottom of the glass but the rest would kind of just remain as a dirty, muddy water. And um, the, an important thing to know about colloids is that the particles do not settle, but they're not able to be taken out by a filter. The Tyndall effect refers to the scattering of light by colloidal particles. So the Tyndall effect is used to determine the existence of a colloid, and colloids scatter light, making a beam visible. But solutions do not scatter with light. So for example, in this picture, you cannot see the light beam in the pure water. However, in the colloidal solution, you are able to see the light beam. So to talk about the differences between electrolytes and non-electrolytes, electrolytes dissolve in water, break up into ions, and conduct an electric current. On the other hand, non-electrolytes, they also dissolve in water, but they do not break up into ions and do not conduct an electric current. So as you can see in the diagram, there is an electrolyte solution and a non-electrolyte solution. So the electrolyte solution contains dissolved ions of NaCl, while the non-electrolyte solution contains dissolved molecules of sugar. However, the sugar molecules, as you can see, have not broken down into ions like the ions of NaCl, and therefore the solution containing Sugar molecules is the non-electrolyte solution because it does not conduct an electric current. So the solution that does conduct a current is the solution containing NaCl. And there are different types of electrolytes. There are strong, which are strong bases. There are weak electrolytes, which are acids and weak bases. And then there are non-electrolytes, which have close to zero conductivity. Here's how surface area affects the rate of solution formation. So breaking the solute into small pieces increases the surface area and allows more collisions to occur. So as we can see in this diagram, the bigger reactants have less collision between the particles, but smaller reactants have more collision between the particles. And more collision directly correlates to a faster rate that a solution forms. So the smaller size of particles equals a greater surface area, and this greater surface area means that a greater amount of molecules are in contact with the solvent. The greater amount of contact equals faster solution formation. A real world example is why we use granulated sugar instead of sugar cubes when we are dissolving sugar into our tea. Agitations also have an effect on the rate of solution formation. So some types of agitations are stirring, which moves dissolved particles away from the contact surfaces more quickly and allows new collisions to occur. Shaking breaks up particles, which creates more contact. And as we know, more contact and collisions directly correlates to a faster rate of solution formation. And blending also breaks up chunks into fine particles and creates a stirring motion that causes more contact. This is why we stir our tea after we put sugar in it. 
Our slide is going to be talking about the effect of temperature on solubility. In um, solubility, it refers to the um, the ability for a solute to to dissolve in a so um, solvent. And as temperature increases, um, the solubility of gases decreases. Okay, so this happens because when something is heated, the kinetic energy increases, causing the particles to move around and collide. And so for gases, they're already pretty far apart. So what happens is when the temperature increases, the intermolecular forces break apart, causing them to escape. And this decreases the solubility. In contrasting to the effect of the temperature on gases, um, the effect of temperature on the solids um, increases the ability for solubility to occur. And this happens because in solids, just as I said before, the kinetic motion increases, the, I mean the heat increases the kinetic motion of the particles, so they collide, um, becoming smaller and being able to dissolve. An example is um, when something is heated, for example, for the snow globe experiment, when we put um, a substance, a solid, inside the cup of water, and then we put it on the Bunsen burner. It heated up to the point um, of solution equilibrium at higher temperature, so it was able to dissolve. So now I'm going to talk about solution equilibrium. So this is a physical state in which um, dissolution and crystallization occur at equal rates. So in simpler terms, it's a state achieved when the molecules of the solid return at the same rate to the crystal the same way as they're dissolving in the solution. For example, in this one about sodium chloride. So basically the molecules are dissolving, the sodium molecules are dissolving at the same rate as they are uh, crystallizing when they return to the molecule. Okay, now I'm going to talk about saturated solutions versus unsaturated solutions. So for saturated solutions, it's basically a solution that contains the maximum amount of the dissolved solute. So when you know the difference or to differentiate as unsaturated versus saturated, for saturated solutions, there's always a substance left at the bottom. For example, if you add more sodium acetate in the same ratio to water, there will be sodium acetate left at the bottom of the water cup. Then for unsaturated, it's a solution that contains less solute than a saturated solution, uh, so it completely dissolves. For instance, um, Evidence of that is that completely dissolves, you can't see any substance left over, no particles at all. So for example, if more water is added than the sodium acetate, then the sodium acetate will be completely gone. Super saturated solution is a solution that contains more dissolved solute than a saturated solution causing crystals to form. So in this case, a solid is heated to the temperature that needs to be dissolved or until it's soluble, which is what we learned before in the effect of temperature, since it's a solid, the increase in temperature usually leads to um, an increase in solubility. So an example of this is sodium acetate, so it's added to water, more of it's added to water, and then it's heated till it dissolves completely. Then when it's left to cool, these crystals start to form as it reaches solution equilibrium at a lower temperature. Another example of this is rock candy, or like in class when we made the snow globes. For instance, we added a substance, a solid, more of it to the water. Then we heated it up on the buds to burners till it dissolved. And then once it dissolved, we left it to cool. And when it cooled, it formed these crystals, which we put in our snow globes. Rock candy is made the same way. Hello, so I'll be talking about the slide of admissible and miscible. Miscible refers to when liquids are able to mix uniformly and um, are able to dissolve and have um, opportunity to uh, higher solubility. And so an example of that would be um, when water and uh, alcohol come into contact, they ultimately form one, one mixture and they both are polar so they are able to mix. Um, however, the opposite would be immiscible because Immiscible refers to when um, two liquids are not able to mix uniformly and instead form two different layers. An example of that would be when water and oil come into contact. Ultimately, they are both um, they have different properties because um, the molecules of water and the molecules so the molecules of water are uh, polar, while the molecules of gas oil is um, 
is nonpolar. And so um, ultimately they cannot mix together and they will just form two <coughs> layers. And as you can see in the image, it shows how like oil is on the top and then water is on the bottom. So ultimately they won't mix together and instead it will just be divided by the meniscus. In this slide, I'll be talking about the effects of pressure on solubility. And so pressure affects uh, the solubility of gases more than it does for um, solids and liquids because gases are less compact. And so an equilibrium is formed with the rate of the dissolved, um, the dissolving gas and the escapement of molecules, of gas molecules um, from the liquid solvent. And so with an additional um, or increasement of pressure, there's an increasement of gas molecules going inside the liquid solvent. And so when the, when the gas molecules um, collide the surface of the liquid solvent, the, uh, there is an increase of solubility and dissolving. And also, increasing the pressure will affect the rate of molecules leaving as well as going into the uh, gas phase. And so there's a shift of the rate and also there's um, increasement of the um, dissolving of the gas molecules into the liquid solvent. And as you can see in the image on the screen, the, the pressure ultimately brings down the molecules into the solvent rather than pushing them away so there's more uh, collision and dissolving. This slide I'll be talking about Henry's law and Henry's law refers to the solubility of a gas in a liquid to be to being proportional to its uh, partial pressure. And so as there is an increasement of pressure, the solubility will increase. And so when the gas molecules are being trapped into the solution, um, they're all being dissolved. And so when you release or you unravel the pressure that is being cr um, exerted on the molecules, there will be a release of gas molecules. And also, through the solution, you'll be able to notice effervescence, which is the formation of gas bubbles. And so, as an example, uh, soda, as seen through the um, slide, you'll be able to notice a picture that um, represents uh, soda, as an example. And so, soda ultimately um, is being, uh, the CO2 gas molecules are dissolved into the solution when there, um, when there's a cap that is um, covering. And... Um, when you release the cap or when you take off the cap, the CO2 bubbles will um, go into gas phase and they will arise. And then there will be effervescence, effervescence, which will be seen through the solution.